welcome. We are so glad that you decided to worship with us today. Whether you're in person or online, we just want to welcome you. And you know what today is? Merry Christmas. Yes, so actually today is Christmas Eve. It's one of my favorite times of the year where we get to worship God because he was born. We're celebrating his birth and we get to spend time with family, open presents. I am super excited about Christmas. It's one of my favorite times of the year. And we know a lot of you might not be here because you're with family right now. So if you're watching online, thanks for joining us and drop us a comment. Let us know who you're watching with and where you're watching from. We love to connect with you. Also, we just want to remind you that if you need prayer, whether you're in person or online, this is just a reminder that please reach out to us at prayer at tlcassembly.org. We want to uplift you and encourage you through prayer. So please reach out. Absolutely. Prayers are great. And look, tonight is one of my favorite times of, of the year as well. We have our candlelight service. What is our candlelight service? Well, simply is that we get a chance to just worship God, sing traditional Christmas songs. And I have some of my favorite Christmas songs. Vicky, what's one of some of your favorite Christmas songs? Oh, I love Oh Come Let Us Adore Him. It's my favorite. Oh, that is that is pretty good. Cool. Yeah, I think you know what my favorite is. I know your favorite song. I think is. you know it. So let's do it together. The first Noel, the angels did sing. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I just get caught up in that in that song. But you know what? Tonight we're going to sing traditional Christmas music and we're going to worship, have a short devotion. So please stay tuned tonight. It'll be exciting and, and it's going to be plentiful. I mean, I'm just super excited. And then next week is our New Year's Eve service. Oh, that's right. That's right. Next week is our New Year's Eve service. Guys, we only have one service at 10 a.m., but we do have our New Year's Eve celebration where we bring in the new year at 6 p.m. next week. You cannot miss it. So please join us. And that is next week. But for today, today, something special. Pastor James Armpriest III, that's Pastor Jim and Brenda's son, is going to be preaching this morning, sharing God's word with us. He's going to be sharing a message entitled, Kids of Christmas. You know, when we come to Christ, we become a new creation. We are adopted into God's family and we become his children, his sons and his daughters. And so we just want to encourage you to open up your heart and ears to hear what God wants to speak through Pastor Jim today. That's we right. appreciate you guys for being here today. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's a message. So right now, let's just calm our hearts. Let's calm our hearts. Let's rise for worship as we begin to worship our King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. I just want to just encourage you to see what God has for you tonight and today. Let's just worship God. Let us rise and worship Him. Thank the Lord. Good morning, TLC. Good morning. Come on. Good morning, TLC. God is good. Come on. I can hear you. God is good. Amen. Let's stand on our feet as we worship the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Come on, put those hands together. Sing joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Sing every heart. Let
Amen. Merry Christmas. It's good to be in God's house this morning, isn't it? There's an awesome story in Luke chapter 1 where Mary visits Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. And when Mary walks in, Elizabeth is filled with joy. She says, Behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb even leaped for joy. And this morning, the presence of Jesus is here right now. And joy is available to each and every one of us. So I don't know what you're walking through. I don't know what you feel this Christmas season, if you are feeling joyful or if you're feeling some despair, but whatever it is, let's just take a moment to look to the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. Jesus, we thank you for your presence in this house this morning. Jesus, we thank you that joy unspeakable is available to us. Jesus, we pray that your joy would overflow, your joy would fill, your joy, Lord God, would come and make us strong this morning, Jesus. Lord, you know everything we walk through and we thank you that our joy isn't tied to circumstances of this world, but it's tied to the fact that you have come. You are here. So we honor your great name, Jesus. We thank you for your presence in this house this morning. And we praise you, Jesus, in your precious name. We say amen, amen. Hey, would you greet someone with a joyous greeting? Say Merry Christmas to someone you didn't come to? Thank you. Amen, amen. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. You guys can find your seat and you may be seated for just a minute. It's so good to be in the house of God this morning. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite the ushers forward and we're going to continue in our time of worship through our tithes and giving to our kingdom fund and just trusting God to continue to bless us as we give freely and fully. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your presence in your house today. We thank you, God, again for this joy that we have available. We thank you that you are a generous and loving God, that there is more than enough in you. And Jesus, we pray that this morning that we would have generous hearts, Lord God, as we come to the end of this year, Lord, we would look back on everything that you have done, at your faithfulness, at your kindness, at your goodness, at your abundance. 
Jesus, that we would just give back a small piece out of gratitude to what you have done in our hearts and our lives. And so we honor your great name, we bless your great name, and we pray this in the name of Jesus, and we say amen and amen. You can turn your attention. We have some video announcements for you. church we're so glad you came to worship with us today here at transformation life church we are continuing to empower people to live the abundant life that god desires for us our mission is to discover truth develop life-giving relationships and do good there's plenty of ways for you to get connected at tlc if you're new here we'd love to get to know you please fill out a connect card if you are in person or simply scan the qr code and connect with us online let's hear what's happening at tlc Join us tonight for our special Christmas candlelight service at 6 p.m. Tonight will be a night full of singing Christmas carols followed by a short Christmas devotional. On Sunday, December 31st, we will have one 10 a.m. service and in the evening we will have our New Year's Eve celebration at 6 p.m. See you there. Psalm 27, my stronghold. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom should I dread? When evildoers come against me to devour my flesh, my foes and my enemies stumbled and fell. Though an army besides me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. For in the day of trouble, He will keep me safe in His dwelling. He will hide me under the cover of His tent. He will set me high on a rock. Then my head will be high above my enemies around me. At His sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says this about you. Seek his face. Lord, I will seek your face. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will rescue me. Show me your way, Lord, and lead me on a level path. Do not give me over to the will of my foes. I will seek the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. Wait for the Lord. There are so many ways to get plugged into our church and serve the Lord. Stay up to date with all of our events and groups on the TLC app. Now, let's continue in worship. Amen. Praise the Lord. Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. Let's just give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Because he's worthy to be praised. Amen. Look at your neighbor say, neighbor. Come on, look at your neighbor say, neighbor. Say, Jesus is the reason for the season. Come on, look at the person behind you. Say, neighbor, good morning. It's good to see you. But Jesus is the reason for the season. Amen. And for that, we just want to speak the name of Jesus this whole season. Amen. Come on, somebody just lift their hands all over this room and just raise up a sound of worship all over this place. 
give the Lord your best worship, your best praise this morning. Those of you that are watching online, right where you are in your house, just raise your hands and just give God your worship this morning because he's worthy to be praised. Father, we thank you this morning for your love. God, we thank you that you were born in this world. And Father, we just want to speak your name that is above all names this morning. And we give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, somebody just shout hallelujah all over this place. Come on, let's just sing. Sing, I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Come on, you sound good this morning. Come on, sing. Over every... Cause I know, cause I know there is Sing, I speak, I speak Jesus Sing, I just want to speak, say I just want to speak the name of Jesus Come on, till every dark Till every dark addiction starts to break Come on, declare it, there is hope
sabia de no. You are worthy. 
the glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise in this house this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen and amen. You may be seated today. Thank you, worship team. Didn't they do a great job this morning? Amen. Merry Christmas to everyone. You can say it back. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. It's good to have all of you. We're going to dismiss our kids now for Kids Church. Um, Can we bring Jimmy's family up before he preaches this so they can see everybody? There's a new addition from last time. I think you saw, saw the family. So we'll just have you come up on the stage. And somebody take a picture. I'm going to get up here. And then we'll let you guys go to Kids Church. So this is James Michael Armpriester IV. And this is the only Armpriester girl, and her name's Lilia. Woo! And this is Judah, and he likes football, right? <laughs> Can you say touchdown? Can you say Buckeyes? Can you say Buckeyes? <laughs> well, he's, he's going to be shy, but he talks a lot. Let's give them a hand this morning. Okay, guys, you can go to Children's Church. I know. It's tough. You going to preach to you, little Jimmy? There we go. <clears throat> you can stay up here. This is, um, this is my son, James Michael Armpriester III. And um, um, his son has just passed on an important legacy. He just learned how to whistle. So all of the Jimmys know how to whistle now. And so that's exciting. It's always great to have... Um, my son with me, and uh, they live in Columbus, Ohio, and, and um, engaged in a variety of different aspects of life, uh, raising a family, but uh, we wanted to invite him. Anytime he can be here, he's such a great uh, communicator, and we really like to hear him preach, and um, he'll bless you today, and, and uh, let's just give him a warm welcome. This is James Michael Armpriester III. Testa. Oh, hey. I am the soft-spoken arm priester, so I probably need this more than anyone else. The last time I uh, uh, spoke was when um, Gabby had her um, son Titus, and someone came up and said, you are the quietest arm priester. You're, you talk way less than your father and your sister. <laughs> so, um, sorry, Gabby, um, but you got, as a big brother, that was my jab. But no, uh, uh, Merry Christmas. It's good to be with all of you guys um, today. I have actually a, a photo of my family. I was, my wife is petrified of being on stage, but she uh, apparently overcame that fear. Um, so I just want to reintroduce my family. This is um, us. Um, since the last time my whole family has been here, it's been a few years. So as my dad mentioned, that's my wife, Allison, of over 10 years. And we have three kids, Jimmy, Lilia, and Judah. And since the last time our whole family is here, I have an additional child and I have less hair. And I think the two might be connected. 
Um, our car ride actually was not too bad. We, we made it here all right. But it is just an honor um, and a joy for me to spend Christmas with you. As I was seeing Kesley and Albert and some of these people I've known for like close to a decade, it's like you guys are an extended family. Um, so I appreciate how every other Christmas you welcome me and I appreciate the chance to be here with all of you. Um, but I've mentioned before, because I've done a lot of Christmas sermons, that I absolutely love Christmas. It is my favorite time of year. Whose favorite season is Christmas? It's legitimately the best. I think it's undisputed. It has the best food, the best movies, the best music, the best light shows, decorations. Did I mention food? It has all the amazing things. Um, and I just love every part of Christmas. But as I get older... The th and have children of my own, Christmas becomes more and more about family. There's just so many things that I enjoy now with my family, and to me, Christmas is about family. I love, I'll take my kids out to go shopping for Allison, and I love how people cannot withhold their smile as my daughter Lilia takes the present and goes, I got the perfect gift to mommy, to every single stranger in the store. And I just see their face light up as she drags, we've already opened presents, the dress that she had picked out that I'm not sure Allison will ever wear going, I have the perfect gift for mommy. Her joy is contagious. And my youngest son, Judah, every time he sees Santa, he'll just go, ho, ho, ho. And that's what everyone does when they hear it. You can't help but laugh when you see it. I love seeing Jimmy turn the corner, sprint down the stairs, and nearly pass out as he sees presents underneath the tree. He's so excited. And this, and if you have kids of your own, you can relate to this. I love how one morning every year, my three children who are sworn enemies, who signed a blood oath to d destroy each other, there is this one time a year as they open up presents where we are a happy, united family and everyone gets along. I love all about Christmas and more and more Christmas is about my family. My children have a contagious joy around Christmas that comes from living in a family where they're very loved and they have an excited anticipation for what is to come on Christmas Day. And so my hope for us today is as we take a look at um, the, the scriptures today, I hope that we can once again become kids of Christmas. The, the theme of family actually starts on the first page of the Bible, and it begins and, and runs through the entire um, pa passage, all through the scriptures. You see this theme of family, family, family that culminates on Christmas morning and ultimately on the cross. And so today I hope to remind you as we journey through this biblical theme of family um, that through Christmas and the cross, you are adopted in a loving family, a family that should bring you joy, a family so united it should be contagious, and a family with an excited anticipation because of what has already happened on Christmas morning. So our story begins in the beginning. Um, we see that God created everything. Out of the waste and the wild, he spoke. And as he spoke, he began to create. And he spoke and he created, and it was a powerful um, um, moment where he stepped back and all that we see was created. But when it came to us, he reached down, he molded us, he breathed life into us. And like a, a child has the attributes of their father, we had the attributes of our father. He created us in his own image. The first page of the Bible was a family. It was a family that was good. We walked with our heavenly father. We had this closeness with our heavenly father. We lived in perfection. We were in the garden with our father. We were experiencing his love. We were a family and it was good. But over time, we began to not trust our Heavenly Father, but reject Him and say we no longer wanted to be a part of His family. We thought that we knew more than our Father, and we rejected Him. And, we, uh, and in that rejection, we introduced sin in our lives, sin which had to separate us from our Father. And we became self-made orphans in that moment in the garden. We became self-made orphans, and because of that, we had to journey east of Eden, and we began walking this path away from the Father for years and years. 
But even in the moment of our rejection, our Heavenly Father said, though you have rejected me and no longer want to be my sons and my daughters, I still want to be your father. In that moment, he spoke of a family and a family that would have a sacrificial son who would come and reunite us and bring us back to God's family. Uh, years would pass, and eventually God would speak to a man named Abram and, and speak through that promise again where he would say to Abram, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All of the families on earth will be blessed through you. At the center of God's plan to, make, to return us who are now self-made orphans, into his family was a family. And this family was called the people of Israel. And they would have a period of time of slavery and wandering in the wilderness and prosperity and then civil war and exile. And they would continue. And they had this mission to bless all of the other families, to bring all of the families back into the family of God. But time and time again, they failed. They continued to reject their father. They continued to choose life as an orphan rather than life as a child of God. But during all this time and the the turmoil that they oftentimes brought upon themselves, there would be prophets that would rise up and talk about one day in this family, there will be a chosen son. There will be someone who will rescue us. There will be someone who brings us back into the family of God. Right as they were about to approach um, one of the most difficult times in this family's history, a prophet named Isaiah um, came up and he spoke the words of God and said, for unto us, a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. After this message, Israel would still, for decades and decades, live as spiritual orphans, awaiting and hoping that someday a son could come that could do what they could not, bring them back to the Father. And that is where the story of Christmas begins. Because the story of Christmas is God the Father sending his son to make us family again. The story of Christmas is Jesus Christ coming so that we could be adopted back into God's family. Just as God had promised in the garden during our fall, just as he had spoken to Abram and through the prophets, a son had come, a child was born. The Apostle Paul talks about this moment in a letter that he wrote to a church, and he says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Throughout the Bible, God uses the story of a family to make us family again. And we see that on Christmas, God the Father sent his perfect son so that we could be adopted as sons. The story of Christmas is about a father and his family. Now, I'll never forget the day that I became a father um, because it was the most traumatic day of my life. And I say that Allison's laughing because I just stood there and was like, whoa. (laughs) And Allison had to deal with literally the craziest scene I've ever seen in my life. So my son, and this is a sign of things to come, he was very, very stubborn. He had a day he was supposed to come and he said no and has been doing that for the last six and a half years. (laughs) And so we were in the hospital. We had stayed overnight. It was the second night and finally it was time to push And what happened next, I think most resembles, have you seen the movie Saving Private Ryan? It's a war movie, and it was not nearly as intense as what was going on in that room. There was people screaming. There was loud noises, people running in and out. I was ducking because there were blows flying in the air. I'm pretty sure there were bullets, and I'm not sure how. It was insane. And for four hours, that's right, I said four hours, Allison pushed. And she pushed and she pushed and she pushed. And there was one point 
this is a true story. You know that it's intense. And if you are about to have a child, if they bring up Hurricane Sandy, which is what they did, just be ready. They said, let's try something we learned in Hurricane Sandy. And so they fashioned bed sheets. They handed one end to Allison. A nurse grabbed the other. And they began to just play tug of war. They pulled and they pulled and they pulled, thinking like, I don't know, it would like loosen things up. It did not. Um, but finally, after four hours of pushing... They pull out the slimiest, palest, alien-looking figure that I've ever seen. They throw him, and his arms are spread wide, and they throw him on Allison, and he's like, Whoa! and I literally, not exaggerating, go, whoa. I was scared to death of that creature. I was contemplating, Allison, you pushed so long, and it wasn't a human. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I, I always joke that it wasn't love at first sight. It was love at second sight. It was traumatic fear at first sight. But eventually, they um, took Jimmy away from Allison as they, like, patched her up from the fight that she had just went through. And um, they handed me my son. And as I held him, I just instantly began to uncontrollably weep um, because I loved him in a different way than I had ever loved anyone. And there's like a passage in scripture where it talks about how nothing can separate us from the Father's love. And as I held Jimmy, I just knew there was nothing he could do. There was nothing that could happen that would ever take away my love for him. And in that day, Jimmy gave me the greatest gift I've ever given, been given. His birth made me a father. And Jimmy's birth also taught me more about the gospel than anyone ever could. In that experience, I began to see the love of a father. I began to see the love of our Heavenly Father. And then I also could see the weight of the Father's sacrifice as he sent his son for me. The story of Christmas is the story of God the Father sending his perfect son, Jesus, to redeem us of our sin and adopt us into his family. When we chose sin, we had made ourselves orphans. We were self-made orphans that needed adoption. But the life that we chose was a life of slavery. Paul uses the metaphor of adoption, but he also uses the metaphor of slavery here because he's showing us that we had become slaves to sin. And we needed someone to redeem us. We need someone to pay the price to free us of our sin. And Paul actually uses the word redeem here multiple times, which was the word used for slaves. So you, uh, someone could pay a, the full price of a slave, and that slave was now a free person. And Paul is saying Jesus Christ on Christmas, when he came to the earth, and what he eventually did for us on the cross was paying the price to free us of our sins. We no longer have to be a slave to sin. We can be, we are paid in full. He paid the price for us. But the cost of sin was death. The punishment of sin uh, is death. And the way for God to redeem us was to send his son to die. Shortly after Jimmy was born, I was praying for him. I was just like praying protection. I think that's like a normal prayer. Um, but my mind just went to like, what if something happened to Jimmy? And it it was just breaking my heart, and I began to um, think about the cross, and there's a line that Jesus says on the cross. He's going, Jesus Christ is dying the death we deserve on the cross. He's experiencing separation from the Father. In his worst moment, what does he cry? My Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me? And I've always felt that from the side of the sun. But as I began to think about Jimmy in his moment of pain or the worst experience of his life, looking at me and saying, why have you forsaken me? That is the worst grief I can personally imagine. And I began to think of the father and how he loved me so much that he endured the grief of hearing his son cry, why have you forsaken me so that I can be a son? That is how loved I am. That is how loved Jimmy is, that God the Father would do that for him. And that is how loved you are, that God the Father would go through the worst grief I can possibly imagine so that you and I and all of us, through faith in Jesus Christ, could be redeemed. That is the price of the cross. We have been redeemed 
through the love of a father and the sacrifice of his son. And so in those moments, it reminds me of my sin. Like when I do a sin, I think it's not that big. I think of the grief that the father took because of my sin. But also in those moments where I feel like worthless, like I'm the worst human being. I was the worst dad today. I was the worst husband today. I am worthless. I am reminded that I am so loved. I am so valuable that God the father went through the worst grief I can imagine so that I could be a son of God. You too are that loved. The story of Christmas is good news because God the Father loved you so much he sent his son. And so we see that we're, we are redeemed, but we're not, re- uh, we're not just redeemed. We're also adopted into his family. The, the chains of slavery weren't cut off from the cross. And God was like, all right, earn your way back to your father. It's going to be a long journey. Start being good. You know, it wasn't that he freed us, but he didn't just free us. He made us family. And Paul uses two different phrases to show us just how in we are in this family. We are not the third cousin twice removed who's randomly showing up to the Christmas party. You're like, who is he? And why is he asking me for money? Um, We're also not the drunk uncle that's talking about politics and the wrong kind of politics. And everyone's like, would this guy just leave? No, Paul is saying you're not awkward or not forgotten, but you are a part of this family. And he uses two words to point this out, two phrases. He tells us um, that we are adopted as sons. And he uses the other phrase, crying Abba, to show us how in we are really in. So Paul is talking to men and women, but he chooses the word sons. And the reason he chooses the word sons, which is like a masculine term, is because in that time, only men could inherit from their father. So to say sons, he's he's pointing to the fact that we can be heirs. We can inherit um, from the father. That we can, even there was this um, situation where even... um, masters could free their slaves and make them sons. And uh, Dr. Timothy Keller points this out and says, sonship is a legal term. In the Greco-Roman world, a childless, wealthy man could take one of his servants and adopt him. And at the moment of adoption, he, could, he would cease to be a slave and, re- and receive all the financial and legal privileges within the estate and outside in the world as the sons and heirs. The work of Jesus Christ made you a full heir. You are a part of this family. And when God the Father sees you, he sees the good works that Jesus Christ did. He sees Jesus' righteousness when he looks at you. You are a full heir of everlasting life when you have faith in Jesus. You're part of the family. But you're not just in the family. Like, technically, all right, you're an arm priester, but... um, I haven't seen you in 12, 20 years, and I, and I don't really know who you are. No, he, Paul also uses the phrase, Abba, Father. He uses the Greek um, word, cry out, which is krasdon, um, which is a word used for a deep, passionate, loud cry. And he uses the word, Abba, which is a, like, a more intimate way to say father, like Papa or, or Daddy. And so not only do we have the status of a true son because of Christmas, We also are so loved that we could be like a child who cries out to his dad and says, Daddy, and expects love, expects an answer, and knows that his father loves him. We can approach God the Father that same way. We can approach him knowing that we are a loved child of God, all because of Christmas and because of the cross. So Christmas shows you that you are adopted into a loving family but it also shows you how to interact with your new family. See, you're in the family of God, but you're not an only child. You have millions and millions of other brothers and sisters in Christ who make up the church. And this is a united, big family. Um, But we all know, who here has a big family? Yeah, a lot of you guys. We all know that with big families can come big problems, right? Has anyone ever, maybe don't raise your hand for this, but has anyone ever hidden at Christmas from your in-laws because it was just too much drama? (laughs) Only one person was bold enough. (laughs) Um, All the rest of you were smart, but I know in your hearts you were like, no, uh, big families, in-laws, it can be awkward. And I, for one, am very aware of that awkwardness. I'll never forget the first time I met my now in-laws. So I was 
I was trying to, um, I wasn't even dating Allison yet, so I was trying to make a good impression. I was over at her house, and I saw this elderly gentleman sitting down. And so I went up to him, and I said, hey, my name is Jimmy. You must be Allison's grandfather. And he looked at me and went, I'm her 49-year-old uncle. And my foot was in my mouth. I was so embarrassed. If I could have, like, snapped and disappeared, I would have. Uh, I tried. He's like, why are you snapping? I was like, don't worry about it. Yeah. But it was this incredibly awkward moment. And the second time I met him, he was just as awkward and crazy. So he takes me to his house and he brings me in the kitchen. And on top of their fridge where they store their food is a 50-year-old dead rabbit in a jar. Yes! Am I, is that weird? And I'm like, okay. And so then, to not, that's not even the weirdest thing that happened that day. He then picks up a live chicken, which he just has in his backyard because I don't know. And he, he takes it and begins to chase me around the house with a live chicken. And I'm like, what in the world am I doing here? The first time I met Allison's grandfather, he, we spent 30 minutes where he was trying to get me to prove that my name was Jimmy. He called my mother a liar. He said the ID was forged. He was not buying it, and he was messing around. And the second time I met her grandfather, he grabbed me by the neck and choked me for 30 seconds, patted me on the back and said, you're all right, kid. <laughs> all of this to say, I know a little bit about awkward in-laws. <laughs> I know how it can be to have that transition and that awkwardness into a new family. But despite those differences, when I see Allison's family over a decade later, I, like Uncle George, I love Uncle George. He is family to me. And he still loves chickens, and I still don't. And he still has that rabbit on the fridge, and I still think it's weird. But we both are united by a common love for Allison. And, and Allison's children, which are also my children, that, that common love that we have for Allison and our family has made us family. And our love is so strong and, and for Allison and my kids uh, mutually that we're not just like can coexist, but we love each other now too. I have fun with Uncle George as long as he keeps the chickens in the backyard. <laughs> And Paul says that this new family that you've been adopted to because of Christmas and the cross is a family that should be united with a common love, a common love for the son who came on Christmas. We have a common love and something that's perfect in Jesus Christ, and that should bring us together. Paul says a few verses earlier um, in his letter that for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ and have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying and telling them that families born out of Christmas and the cross are uniquely united. So there is no Jew or Gentile, slave and free, male and female. They are all one. What this means for us today is that regardless of your culture, be it um, or, or ethnical or um, political backgrounds, whether you're poor, wealthy, or middle class, um, whatever gender you are, no matter what makes you unique, we should still live united as one family. None of that makes us inferior or superior because all of us had to have the Son of God die for us so that we could be saved. That's how sinful every single one of us is. That's how we are. But all of us are equally as loved because God sent his son to die for you and just as much as he did the person next to you. And so we have this unity, this thing that drives us together, which is the work of Jesus Christ. And just as my kids and hopefully your kids can get along on Christmas morning, we should be able to get along because of Christmas. We should allow our differences to make us a beautiful, unique family, but also we shouldn't allow that to divide us in our family. Christmas shows that you are adopted into God's family, how to interact in your new family, but it also shows you how your family can continue the mission of Christmas. Just like my kid's joy for Christmas was contagious when Judah says, ho, 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 everyone here laughed when I told that story. It was contagious. So too should our joy be from what happened on Christmas in the cross. We should be contagious.
contagious and begin to bless those around us. Remember earlier that uh, the verse I read of, that God spoke to Abram, where he said that through Abram, all the families would be blessed. That primarily was foretelling the coming of Jesus Christ, that through his death and resurrection, all of us would have hope and could have faith in him and be forgiven of our sins. But it also is reminding us of our mission as a family of God. Uh, we have a mission to, ex- to extend the family and to bless those around us, to bless our neighbors, our, our coworkers, all of those around us. We want, uh, he wants us to bring in our fa- more people into the family of God. When I was six years old, we lived in Cincinnati, and I received the most traumatic, most devastating news any six-year-old has ever heard in their entire life. I was going to have to share a room with my little sister. The reason, Amy. Her name was Amy. Amy was someone who didn't have a place to live, and so our family invited her into our, my parents invited her into our family, and she was living with us, and the hope was that by being a part of our family, she would join the family of God. And so eventually we moved into a bigger house, and I got my own room, so Amy was uh, someone I could tolerate, I guess, and over time that turned from her being someone I could tolerate to becoming family. She would help me with my homework and sometimes just do my homework for me, which was really cool. (laughs) She would teach me cool music, she'd drive me around, and she would just look after me. And over time, as she became more and more a part of our family, she became more and more a part of the family of God. She would later on move out and marry the worship pastor of our church. She's, has, she's had kids and a family, and her life has been forever changed. And she's someone that our family is super proud of because of the way that she's lived, because of the way she's raised her kids, because of the, the life that she's lived. And it's all because my parents decided to make someone who wasn't family family, hoping that they would become part of God's family. That is part of what we are called to do as Christians. The story of Christmas should move us to not only love our own family, but to intentionally think, how can we grow the family of God? And as I wrap up, if the worship team wants to come, um, as, as Christmas comes and you look forward to the new year, I want you to spend some time reflecting on the story of Christmas In the midst of your family celebrations, I want you to think of the perfect family that you have because of Jesus Christ. I want you to be reminded of how loved you are that God the Father was willing to send his only son for you. And in the midst, if if Christmas, for some people, holidays is really exciting. Other people, it's a time of loneliness or maybe um, grief, as you remember, um, past family members that aren't there. In those moments, you also find joy Remind yourself that you are so loved. The father went through the deepest grief he could imagine. One, he can relate to the grief that you're experiencing in that moment. And two, he's made a reason for joy. Because of Christmas and the cross, you can have joy as adopted sons and daughters of Jesus. And as you watch your kids get along that one day of the year as their opening presents, I hope that that can just spark a memory to to remind you that you are part of a bigger family a family that should be united. If you are here in a Christian, you should be part of the most diverse and yet most loving family imaginable on the face of the earth. You are so loved um, by the Father. You should extend that love to each other. Think in those moments this weekend, how are you interacting in your church family? Do you know the people in church? Would you consider them family? Are they the stranger that sits two rows in front of you? Allow, spend some time today over this Christmas season thinking about how you can grow the family, um, the church family of God. And finally, as you think through your family's New Year's resolutions or, or goals for the year, or what, what, however you guys think through the, the coming year, I want you to write down a family's name. I want you to write down a family that you can make family. Think of someone that you could bring in, whether it's um, a co-workers family, one of your kids' friends' families, a neighbor's family, um, someone that you interact with, who is someone that you can live out the mission of Christmas? 
where you can be a blessing to them. Maybe it's financial, maybe it's through time, maybe it's through um, just listening. What does that look like? And how can you try to bring them into your family so that you can make them the family of God? Christmas is about family. Through Christmas and the great cost of the cross, you are adopted into a loving family, a family that should bring you joy, a family so united it should be contagious, and a family with an excited anticipation of what is to come because of Christmas. Let's be this year the family that God has called us to be. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you loved us enough to send your son. We're so thankful that the story of Christmas is a story of hope, that we no longer have to be orphans, we no longer have to be slaves, but that we can become family. Help us to accept that gift that you've given us through the cross. Help us to live with the joy and the comfort knowing that we have family, family in you, that we have a perfectly heavenly Father, that we can cry, Abba, Father, too, and know that you'll hear us and that you love us. I pray, God, that you would help us as a church to be united in the way that we love, that our love would be contagious so that other families around us would want to see what is this thing that brings these different people together so that people in the neighborhoods around us would begin to see how great you are. Lord, I just thank you so much again that you care for me, that you've included my family in yours. Help my family and help our families be families that share the love of Jesus this year. We thank you so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord. Cause you deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. Come on, lift those hands and sing. You are worthy of it all. For from you all are things. For from you all are things. And to you all, all things, you deserve the glory. Come on, sing it again, say, you are worthy of it all. Come on, tell the Lord, tell him, say, you are worthy of it all. Jesus, for from you all. 